Navigation using a grid work of hyperbolic curves was the first major advancement to the art of navigation since the invention of the chronometer by Britain's John Harrison in 1764. The principle involving hyperbolic curves was barely understood by those who used the system. However, it played a major role in the victories achieved during World War II. Our story starts in 1935 when the British were awakened to the vulnerability of their largely unprotected island empire. Strangely, it was not Hitler or the growing Nazi war machine that stimulated the Brits to action. It was a science fiction movie titled War of the Worlds by H. G. Wells. Robert Watson Watt and a team of scientists and engineers were assigned the task of designing a radar shield to protect Great Britain. Watt's team tackled their job with a sense of urgency. Of course, their principal job was creating radar transmitters and designing transmission towers. However, one member of the team was an electronic wizard named Robert J. Dippy. Bob Dippy was a creative genius and in 1937 suggested they include a grid system of hyperbolic curves, basically a short-range navigation system, to be used guiding British bombers safely home to their bases. However, Dippy's plan was rejected since it was not directly associated with the radar defense shield. It was placed in the so-called ice box and consigned to obscurity. Robert Watson Watt and his team went on to complete the radar defense shield, which proved to be the critically important factor that won the air war for England during the Battle of Britain, July through October 1940. The English were striking back, but the British bomber crews, who always flew at night, were having a hard time finding and hitting their targets in Germany. In 1941, D. M. Butt prepared a report that showed only 10% of RAF bombers penetrated within 10 miles of their target. Robert Dippy's navigation system was retrieved from the icebox and put to the test. Under his leadership, a team of engineers, scientists, electronic technicians, and cartographers put together the so-called G for grid system, the heart and soul of his hyperbolic curve grid system. Before going into details of this system, let us make an attempt to describe the hyperbolic curve and its relationship to this important navigation system. Of course, I might get a mathematician to describe the technical details of a hyperbolic curve. However, I feel that most of us would fail to gain much from such a lecture. Instead, let us show how we may create a hyperbolic curve by using a scale drawing and graphics. We will develop an imaginary situation First, create two islands in the ocean that are 60 miles apart. Call them the North Island and the South Island. There is a line of buoys marking a channel between the North and South Islands. We are going to graphically measure the positions of these buoys using two imaginary speedboats called the North Boat and the South Boat. These boats have exceptional hypothetical capabilities. First, they start and stop instantaneously. Second, their speed is constant at 60 miles per hour or one mile per minute from start to stop. Third, they travel in a straight line toward their objective. And fourth, most important, they start at exactly the same instant. Using these imaginary boats, we will measure the distance to the first buoy, labeled A, 
located a little north of the halfway point between the North and South Island. The North boat required 20 minutes to reach buoy A, showing the distance to be 20 miles. The South boat required 40 minutes to reach buoy A, showing the distance to be 40 miles. The difference in their time of arrival was 20 minutes. Next we will measure the distance to buoy B. The north boat required 30 minutes to reach buoy B. The south boat required 50 minutes. The difference in their time of arrival was 20 minutes. The difference in time of arrival at buoys C, D, and E was 20 minutes in each case. Moving to the northwest, we find the difference in time of arrival at this buoy was also 20 minutes. The difference in time of arrival for all of these buoys was 20 minutes. And it is this single factor that places all of these buoys on a hyperbolic curve. Further, if a buoy was located 180 miles away and it took the north boat three hours to reach it, and the south boat required 20 minutes longer, that buoy would also be on the same hyperbolic curve. Now Bob Deppy certainly did not use hypothetical speedboats to create his G for grid system. He used radio waves that travel at the speed of light or 186,000 miles per second. However, Dippy's measurements were not in seconds. His standard of measurement was microseconds, or millionths of a second. Roughly speaking, radio waves and light travel at a speed of about 1,000 feet per microsecond, or 5 microseconds per mile. Of course, Bob Dippy used exact values, not approximations. All measurements were made on a cathode ray oscilloscope in a unit designed by Bob Dippy, we navigators called the G-Box. Let us now return to the hypothetical North and South Islands, where we will install a master pulse transmitting station on the South Island and a slave transmitter on the North Island. Basically, the master station transmit a warning pulse, signaling the slave station to transmit a G pulse. With phenomenal time delay accuracy, the master station waits the required microseconds for the slave station to receive the warning, and then both stations transmit a G pulse at exactly the same instant. An aircraft or boat equipped with a G-Box at buoy E will receive the two signals and measure the difference in their time of arrival. The first signal required 450 microseconds to reach the unit. The second signal required 550 microseconds and shows up on the trace, also called the time line of the cathode ray tube, 100 microseconds later. This time delay places the unit on the hyperbolic curve that passes through all of the buoys. Once again, it is the difference in time of arrival that creates the hyperbolic curve. Since the position of the buoys has not changed, the time of arrival of the pulse signals at each station will be 100 microseconds, again showing that these buoys are on a hyperbolic curve. These curves may be calculated using the formula illustrated. At least two grid systems must be used to create a G-chart. Using the island example, a second grid based upon master and slave stations located on east and west islands about 70 miles apart would provide an ideal G-chart. One of the grids, for example the north-south, would be colored red, and the other, for example the east-west, would be green or purple or blue. 
This basically is how Bob Dippy developed a navigation chart system using the hyperbolic curves created by pulse radio signals. Creating the G Navigation System The challenge facing Bob Dippy to create a navigation system that would cover the British Isles and Western Europe, including the Ruhr Valley, was formidable. However, he was surrounded by very capable people at the Telecommunications Research Establishment, commonly referred to as TRE. There were three major tasks confronting them. The first task was to design a cathode ray oscilloscope that had the following features. First, compact and rugged enough to handle rough weather aboard a ship and hard landings in an aircraft. Two, user-friendly and easy to operate by operators with little knowledge of electronic gadgets like the oscilloscope. Third, Bob Dippy insisted on a cathode ray tube display showing traces for two grid systems at the same time. All existing units showed only one trace. After making a reading on such a unit, the operator had to tune in to a second pulse radio station to read the second trace. This caused a loss in time and accuracy. The second task involved building master stations and slave stations to transmit pulse signals. This included spotting and erecting transmission towers for each station about 60 to 70 miles apart. Accurate measurement of the baseline between these master and slave towers was critically important to the overall accuracy of the system. Bob Dippy precisely measured the baseline distance by timing microwave seconds required to transmit a pulse signal to the slave tower and responded back to the master tower. This tower was located about seven miles south of the airfield at Bassingbourne, England, home of the 91st Bomb Group. It was a master station transmitting pulse signals to three separate slave stations and grid systems. As may be seen in this small section of the G-chart, there are three grid systems, colored red, blue, and green. The red grid system covers an area to the north and south. The blue grid system is west-southwest to east-northeast, and the green grid system is northwest to southeast. The intersection of any different colored grid lines provides the navigator with an accurate precision report. After the locations for the master and slave stations were established, mathematicians calculated and plotted the hyperbolic curves that formed the grid system. The parabolic curves generated were assigned distinctive numbers. Further, the strobe scale of the oscilloscope automatically adjusted to the numbering system of each grid pattern. Cartographers then printed this grid in color on a standard Mercator projection chart. At least two grid systems in different colors were required for each chart. The so-called G-Box created by Bob Dippy met all of the goals of Task 1. As may be seen in the photo, the unit was compact. The illustrated unit, designed for a British bomber that always flew at night, does not have the daylight scope used in 1944 and 45 by the United States Army Air Force. There were very few controls on the G-Box. The operator could control four or five basic tasks. First, change radio frequencies for either of the pulse radio stations. 
Second, expand the size of the blip for accuracy of reading. Third, control position of the marker blip with a knob. And fourth, throw a switch and read the strobe scale of the marker blip. Other than turning the unit on and off, that's about all the navigator needed to do. By contrast, a similar cathode ray oscilloscope called the APN-9 and built later for the United States Army Air Force had 18 separate knobs and switches that controlled critical settings for the unit. Invariably, operators would fiddle with the settings and mess up the image. As one navigator put it, at such times the APN-9 was only useful as a place to hang your hat. The G-Box illustrates the practical nature of Bob Dippy's genius. All of the critical adjustments were hidden inside the cover of the G-Box and accessible only to the tools of a trained technician. Of course, Bob Dippy was also successful in including two traces on the scope as shown. To illustrate the importance of these two traces, let me explain how my pilot Jim Tyson and I practiced bad weather G approaches to a landing at the 381st Bomb Group in Ridgewell, England. We usually landed on runway 28 or 280 degrees and one of the G lines on my G chart almost exactly paralleled this runway. Prior to takeoff, as Jim was running up the engines, I took G-fixes establishing our position, for example as 15.5 on the red grid that placed us in the center of the runway and at 28.4 on the green grid that placed us at the power off or touchdown point. These two values were noted in my log. We started our landing approach 10 or 15 miles east of the field where I set my upper trace marker blip at 15.5 and the lower trace marker blip at 28.4. In this illustration, marker blips are above the trace line and live blips are below the trace. I then guided the plane until the left leading edge of the upper trace live blip was in line with the marker blip as shown. This put us on a course that ran down the center of the runway. At that point, Jim picked up a heading of 280 degrees and reset his gyro compass. When the plane drifted off course, I would direct it back until the blips were realigned and held steady on course for the new heading. If that heading was 286 degrees, we knew we had a wind from the north causing us to crab right 6 degrees to stay on course. Using the lower trace, I took periodic measurements of the range as Jim descended towards our red line altitude of 100 feet. Our goal was to reach that altitude the width of one blip short of our touchdown point. I watched the live blip on the bottom trace as it moved to the right. When the right side of the lower live blip lined up, with the left side of the upper marker blip, Jim started his descent towards the touchdown point with the gyro compass reading 286 degrees. Jim was low enough to cut power when I told him the left leading edges of both blips on the lower trace were in alignment. Our emergency landing practice flights worked out smoothly on every occasion and we had full confidence we could bring our plane into a safe landing, even in a pea soup English fog. Essentially, Jim Tyson and I taught ourselves these emergency landing procedures during January and February of 1944. 
Neither of us had ever heard of G before arriving at Ridgewell late in December, and our practice time was limited to the rare occasions when we were lucky enough to draw a recently arrived V-17 modified with the English G-Box. However, the G-Box was user-friendly, and I had no trouble adapting to the new technology. Following three raids in a row to Berlin on March 8th, Jim Tyson and I were called into the group commander's office and offered a transfer on detached service to become a lead crew with the newly formed Pathfinder Force then stationed at the 305th Bomb Group at Chelveston. We felt honored and accepted the offer along with one other crew from the 381st Bomb Group. Carl Clark was the pilot and Clem Obler the navigator. About ten days later we arrived at Chelveston ready and eager to learn how to become a lead crew for the 1st Bombardment Division. However, the day after our arrival we were called to the briefing room and briefed for a mission the following day and ordered to fly to the 381st Bomb Group that evening. As I left the briefing room I passed the lieutenant colonel who had briefed us. I stopped and asked, when does the school start to teach us how to become a lead crew? The lieutenant colonel rolled a cigar in his mouth and said, Lieutenant, as of right now you are a lead navigator. Get going. The die was cast, so Jim Tyson and I worked out our problems together. Fortunately, that mission was scrubbed before the briefing at Ridgewell and we gained a few days to work on the problems confronting us. Our first task was to get acquainted with the new Pathfinder B-17 that was issued to Jim Tyson. It had all the latest navigation equipment including an H-2X radar in the radio room and of course a G-Box for me on my navigator's table. I was even provided with an electric muff to keep my hands warm and fingers from freezing. Outwardly, there were two distinctive features on the plane. First, there was no ball turret or gunner. The turret was replaced with the radar dome for the H2X radar. While in flight, the dome was cranked down about 18 inches but it had to be retracted by a waist gunner before landing. The second feature was the triangle marking on the vertical stabilizer. The symbol of the first bombardment division was a triangle, the second bombardment division was a circle, and the third a square. Normally a letter was inside this symbol such as a triangle L for the 381st bomb group, a triangle G for the 305th bomb group and a triangle A for the 91st bomb group. However, the Pathfinder Force planes were meant to lead any one of these groups, so the logo for the Pathfinder Force was a black triangle without lettering. The plane carried number 297625 on the tail, but no name or logo on the nose. Jim asked the crew if they had any suggestions for naming our plane. Since Jim Tyson came from Southern California, I suggested we call it the Sunkissed Special. Of course, I had visions of the nose artist painting a scantily clad, sun-tanned vixen on the nose to support the name. But Jim Tyson was very conservative and the only married man on the crew. He vetoed the vixen and had the nose artist paint a sun-kissed naval orange as our logo and symbol of good luck. Apparently it was a good choice for it carried us successfully through the rest of our tour of duty. Our first job was to get familiar with our new plane and the added crew member who operated the H2X radar and replaced our ball turret gunner. John Sperling was the so-called Mickey operator who flew with us most of the time. 
However, there was some flexibility in these assignments. My position in the nose compartment was about the same, except that a brand new G-Box took up the left side of my desk. This picture shows the author at the navigator's table of a B-17 in Duxford, England in 1992. There is no G-Box on this table. It normally sat by my left arm. Above my head may be seen the control box for the radio compass. This was another navigation aid. We could tune in to a splasher or a buncher beacon using the frequency shown on a flimsy issued to the navigator before each flight. In addition, the navigator had a complete set of instruments on an overhead panel, including an airspeed indicator, flux gate compass, radio compass needle, altimeter, and an outside thermometer. Of course, the Sunkiss Special had mountings for the Norden bombsite, but these were always kept in safe storage until needed. One of our great disappointments in the new job occurred a few days after our arrival at Chelveston. Frank Palahniuk, our bombardier, was ordered to return to Ridgewell. Apparently, group commanders were unhappy accepting a stranger to make the bomb drop and insisted upon supplying their own proven bombardiers. I certainly did not agree with that decision, for Frank Palahniuk was one of the best. However, I quickly adapted to my new office in the nose of the Sunkiss Special. My only complaint was that my seat was the usual hard wooden box of extra 50 caliber ammunition. I eased that problem somewhat by switching from a chest pack to a seat pack parachute which provided a modest cushion and was always with me. To get started in our new job as a lead crew, we spent many hours in the air on practice flights. Jim Tyson considered the main task confronting him was to establish a standard turning rate as the leading aircraft in a combat wing formation of 54 B-17s. We had been exposed to poor leadership and knew the consequences. Inexperienced leaders often turn too sharply and the results were disastrous. The entire formation was almost one mile wide. When the turning rate was too fast, those on the outside couldn't keep up and were calling the leader advising they couldn't keep up. At the same time, those on the inside of the turn were screaming into their mic, Speed it up! Speed it up! We're about ready to stall out with a full load of bombs! We practiced timed turns for several days. Jim finally decided his standard turning rate would be one quarter needle width on his turn and bank indicator. This produced a turn requiring four minutes to swing through 180 degrees with a radius of four miles. This standard turning rate was a big help to me as his navigator and a critically important feature for being able to hit departure and checkpoints on time. The biggest challenge facing me was to find a way to determine an accurate direction and velocity of the wind at altitude in straight and level flight. Of course, I was familiar with the double drift meter approach taught in navigation school, but the cloudy skies of England, coupled with the huge formations we were leading, ruled this method out. I developed what I called a six-minute wind procedure, and Jim Tyson and I tested it on many practice flights. Essentially, 
we were able to obtain relatively accurate wind data by making a six minute straight and level flight and using the wonderful G-Box to determine our actual position at the beginning and end of the six minute period. The procedure we followed is shown on this G-chart. First, we picked a period in the flight plan when we would be flying straight and level for at least six minutes. In the example shown, we were flying due north when I took a G-fix to start the observation and then kept an air plot or a no wind position as we flew north six minutes. At the end of the six minute period I took another G fix which showed we had a wind from the northeast and our actual course is shown as the dotted blue line. The wind direction vector is the orange line from the six minute no wind position at the end of the black line to the actual position at the end of the dotted blue line. The length of the orange line is two nautical miles. Simply multiply this by 10 and find the rate is 20 knots or about 23 miles per hour and the wind direction is from 31 degrees. The six minute wind gave us our first indication of wind at altitude while we were assembling the formation over England. However, G was effective and generally not jammed until we reached the coast of Europe. Consequently, I was able to make longer test runs and gain more accurate determinations of the wind at higher altitudes over the channel. This was essential data for the dead reckoning navigator who had to provide accurate wind data to the bombardier or to the Mickey operator if bombing through the clouds. During the next six weeks we led only three missions on deep penetrations, but we spent many hours practicing departure procedures, timed turns, and getting acquainted with the navigation potentials of the H2X radar. The standard turning rate adopted by Jim Tyson proved to be a boon to me. By taking advantage of the accurate positions supplied by the G-Box, we were able to hit our scheduled departure times within a few seconds. The procedure we developed worked like this. Normally, the first combat wing assembled in an oval traffic pattern between Bassingbourne and Debden. We were usually given departure points, time, and altitude to leave Bassingbourne, and other departure time for leaving England. Our normal departure points from England were Lowestoft, Cromer, and Beachy Head. We were given a time, altitude, and heading to B over these points. There were no air traffic controllers and we were expected to follow the flight plan closely and accurately. Two combat wings of 54 planes competing for the same airspace over Lowestoft at the same time would have been disastrous. The hours of practice we spent developing time turns paid off. I knew that a 90 degree turn would require two minutes, a 180 degree turn required four minutes, and I could kill eight minutes making a 360. As an example, if we were to depart from Bassingbourne at 12,000 feet on a heading east, of 90 degrees at 920 hours, I would fly a reciprocal heading west of 270 degrees, 8 miles north of Bassingbourne. When we passed abreast of Bassingbourne, I checked the time. Let us say it was 900 hours. This meant I had 20 minutes before the scheduled departure. Since the 180 degree turn would require 4 minutes, 
I had 16 minutes to divide between flying west and then east. By making minor allowances for the effect of wind, we were able to hit our departure within seconds, even while leading a formation of 54 bombers. On May 1, 1944, the entire Pathfinder force of the 1st Bombardment Division was transferred to Bassingbourne, headquarters of the 1st Combat Wing. Immediately the pace picked up and we led two raids to Berlin, one to Kiel, and another to the Dessau Leipzig synthetic fuel plants during May. Our many hours of practice paid off and the G-Box became an extension of my right arm. To illustrate, I used the Edinburgh Hamburg G-Chart on a raid to Kiel and while returning from one raid to Berlin. This illustration shows the fixes I made on my G-Chart during those two raids. There were no landmarks over the frigid waters of the North Sea and I was required to know our position at all times, especially while returning from a raid. Several of the planes among the 54 in our combat wing formation were damaged by flak and fighter attacks. If any plane was forced to ditch, we had to send an accurate position report to Air Sea Rescue, and it was my responsibility to provide that information to the acting wing commander who flew as our co-pilot. German jamming was effective over the continent but diminished over the open waters of the North Sea. It was truly comforting to be able to take a G-fix shortly after leaving the Danish coast as we headed west and south towards home. G was considered a short-range navigation aid the carrier frequency range for the pulse transmissions was 60 to 90 megahertz, basically a line of sight transmission. However, the longest fix I ever made measured 339 statute miles from the G stations in Scotland, well beyond the line of sight distance. Presumably, this added distance was achieved by bouncing transmission off the surface. Of course, accuracy of the fix decreased with range. However, a fix with an error of plus or minus 10 miles was welcome under the circumstances. On May 29th, eight days before D-Day, things changed. The entire Pathfinder force of the 1st Bombardment Division was ordered to camera bomb a jetty in the town of Skegness using a combination G H2X radar through the clouds bombing technique. In this procedure, the DR navigator placed the aircraft on a course G line that ran through the target and fed this information to the bombardier. The Mickey or H2X radar operator also fed range or distance to the target to the bombardier. The bombardier determined the bomb release point from the information plus altitude, ground speed, and temperature. Although the target was visible, we were ordered to set the bomb release point from information provided by the G-Box and H2X radar. The range of the H2X radar was very accurate, but the G-course line at our 15,000 foot altitude was about 200 feet right of the target. We practiced another five hours on May 31st. On June 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, we used the same through the clouds technique, bombing shoreline targets in the Pas de Calais area. On June 5th, we visually attacked a gun emplacement north of Cayenne, and on June 6th, D-Day, we again bombed through the clouds, hitting gun emplacements due north of Bayou on Gold Beach in support of British and Canadian troops. 
The 200 foot shift in the course line was caused by altitude and not considered significant since the attacking formation was about 1400 feet wide. G was absolutely essential in enabling me to lead a formation of bombers hitting checkpoints on time and remaining on course in crowded skies at all times. Down below, 1,000 ships were crowded in the narrow English Channel following prescribed narrow pathways through lanes cleared of mines. They too were required to stay on course in pitch black darkness and hit checkpoints on time. This would have been an impossible task without the aid of hyperbolic navigation aids such as Bob Dippy's G-Box and the D-Day chain G-Chart. This basically is the story of the unheralded contribution of hyperbolic curve navigation and its importance to the victories achieved in the air war in Europe, the Battle of the Atlantic, and the wide expanses of the Pacific Ocean. The United States Coast Guard created and maintained the Atlantic and Pacific chains of Loran stations, and Bob Dippy was instrumental in creating the G navigation system covering England and eventually all of Western Europe. Of course, hyperbolic curved navigation has now been replaced by GPS satellite navigation, but it played an extremely important part in the victories achieved during World War II. We should not forget those who contributed their talents and creative genius to that victory. Epilogue The original intent of this story was to describe the wonderful G navigation box that I used as a Pathfinder navigator during World War II. It was easy to use, precise, and a quick way to determine one's position in the cloudy and crowded skies of England and over parts of Europe. It is also one of the untold stories about a weapon of the Allies that helped immeasurably towards the final victory achieved. However, the more I researched the history of the so-called G navigation system, the more I became aware of the importance to the overall war effort of its creator, Robert J. Dippy. Bob Dippy was obviously an introvert, but he was a quiet, unassuming, practical, electronic genius when it came to designing the new system of hyperbolic curve navigation and building the user-friendly tools to make the system work. He first suggested the G navigation system while working with Robert Watson Watt on the design and construction of the radar shield to protect Great Britain in 1937. But his ideas gathered dust in the so-called icebox for four years. In 1940, Bob Dippy was loaned to the United States Coast Guard, helping the Americans develop and debug their Loran, or Long Range Hyperbolic Curve Navigation System. Bob Dippy was supposed to have been loaned for a two-week period, but the Americans held on to him for eight months. Despite the fact that he was trying to protect their lifeline of shipping, the British were quite upset. Only 10% of British bombers were reaching within 10 miles of their nighttime targets, and Bob Dippy was ordered to return home. His G system was retrieved from the icebox. He then designed and created the accurate navigation system badly needed by the RAF. The system worked and was adapted for use by the 8th Air Force in late 1943 and 1944. Further, 
his contributions to the Loran system were quite valuable. Loran ultimately proved to be a prime factor in defeating the U-boat menace in Atlantic. Another scientist named Alec Reeves designed a blind bombing technique called OBO. It was highly accurate but had the disadvantage of being able to work with only one bomber force at one time. Bob Dippy worked for TRE, the Telecommunications Research Establishment. They were assigned the job of upgrading the OBO system the solution was the creation of a blind bombing system called GH. Bob Dippy's G-Box was put to use performing dual functions. First, in its normal role as a navigation tool, locating the position of the aircraft on the hyperbolic curves of a G-chart. Second, by throwing a switch, the unit was transformed to a flying oboe station that transmitted signals to cat and mouse transponders. These transponders could handle eight separate bombing formations at the same time. The G-8 system was used successfully by the RAF and 8th Air Force during the fall of 1944 and 1945. My search for details about Bob Dippy was sketchy. Only three pictures have been made available to me. They were provided by Douglas Fisher, a photographer for TRE during World War II. The first shows Dippy in the center of the group assigned the job of creating the G system of navigation apparently in 1941. The second shows a group meeting apparently at TRE discussing plans for G coverage of the invasion on D-Day. A G chart was created especially for naval vessels covering the channel and the invasion beaches called the D-Day chain. One other feature is that the power output of the master and slave stations was increased by 200 to 300 percent to override German attempts to jam the systems. I used those signals to guide the group of 18 bombers I was leading. The signals were loud, clear, and accurate. About this time, Bob Dippy suffered a serious setback. His wife died in childbirth and he was devastated. Fortunately, his son survived and Bob Dippy regained his composure. I'm not sure whether Bob Dippy was involved in the Skywave Loran program. It is a system that bears his stamp of imagination and creativity. The two baselines for this system stretch from Scotland to North Africa and from Morocco to Egypt. Coverage included almost all of Western Europe. Rewards were handed out to the Brits involved in these activities. Robert Watson Watt, who developed the radar defense shield, was knighted by the king and became Sir Robert Watson Watt. Alec Reeves used Dippy's proven system of accurately measuring baseline distances between transmission towers by timing radio waves to create OBO. He was rewarded with the Order of the British Empire. However, when I went to the Imperial War Museum in London searching for a picture of Robert J. Dippy, I was informed that nothing was available. Nothing. I am still in shock for this was a creative genius who guided thousands of British and American airmen through dark foggy skies and even to safe landings in pea soup fogs using his G-box. Further tens of thousands of sailors were safely guided through narrow lanes cleared of mines 
in the crowded channel during the black night of D-Day. Following the invasion, one naval officer remarked, they should not have called it D-Day, they should have called it G-Day. Apparently, Robert J. Dippy has been denied his due rewards and consigned to history's trash barrel by his countrymen. Perhaps, just perhaps, this is the reason Bob Dippy moved to the other side of the world, to New Zealand, following World War II, and faded into obscurity.